different conceptual uh, explanation of coroutines. I wish I had better, I'll, I'll make better visual graphics and I'll polish this lecture more as time goes by. This is just like a rough version. The second part we're going to talk about is the, the practical uh, things we need to do to get coroutines working in our Android applications. This can also extend to other platforms, but I'm going to assume you're an Android developer. Um, but like I say, there's some general generalities here that we can apply. So I talked about all those different things. I talked about uh, suspending functions. I talked about a continuation. I talked about coroutine context. I talked about job. There's another thing which I really need to talk about, which you need to know about with coroutines, and that is a coroutine scope. So that's what we have on this side of my horrendous, horrendously drawn whiteboard samples. So um, I'm not even really going to waste much time trying to explain conceptually what a coroutine scope is. Um, because it would be tricky, but I'm going to kind of roundabout explain kind of what we need to do and how it works. So practically speaking, as I said before, we can nest coroutines within, within each other. So we can say, for example, in some root object, like a, an activity, like a view model, like a presenter, like a controller, we can start up some coroutines in this root object, and then we can call suspending functions. And those suspending functions, through the magic of the coroutine context and all the stuff I talked about earlier, can basically be nested within one another. So when we think of this word scope, we have like a, a, a circle which is like the, the root coroutine and then everything that's nested inside of it and it's all scoped so when I think of this word scoped if you're wondering it, it's like a way of um, this is, it's a hard word to explain which is why I didn't really bother earlier and here I am trying to explain what it means but uh, it's like a think of it like a container uh, for the nested coroutines the nested units of work the event stream one event stream with one coroutine scope kind of swallowing it all up. Okay, so how do we set up this coroutine scope and what, where should we set it up? And that's kind of one of the keys here. So when you're deciding, and I'll show you what this actually looks like in code in a moment, when you're deciding where to place your which object or even a function, it could apply to a function, but I'll just assume we're doing object-oriented programming here. Um, which object should extend or become a coroutine scope. Generally speaking, the object should have a life cycle. Why? Let's say, for example, we make a view model as our coroutine scope. Or actually, let's take a different example. Let's do model view presenter. We have a presenter uh, that is made as a coroutine scope for a particular feature of the application. And then the user navigates to a different feature of the application. Because we have that scope, and the root object in this example I'm mentioning is a presenter, we can cancel all of that work when the user navigates away from the uh, current feature. Okay, so that's kind of why we need something. It helps to have something that either has a like life cycle or has some kind of way of knowing what the current life cycle is. So this scribble up here says life cycle. Okay, what's the other thing we need to worry about? A scope can be run on a particular thread. When it comes to Android, almost invariably your, your root object, your root scope, should be on the main thread, the UI thread you're going to be able to jump off of the UI thread really easily. I'll show you how to do that. You just use this uh, with context thing. You're going to be able to jump off the main thread when you need to, but you want basically everything to call back to your main thread because ultimately that's 
you're going to be probably rendering something on the user interface. Obviously, there's some situations if you're not dealing with the UI at all, maybe you don't have to be on the, maybe you want to be on the main thread, but in any case, generally speaking, what I'm saying here is, and we'll see this in a minute, Whatever is your root object, your it could be an activity. If you don't have any kind of architecture, you could make your activity a friggin' coroutine scope. I don't suggest it, but you can make your view model, your presenter, controller, whatever, your servlet maybe, if you're in a Java E. And the last point here is we want to kind of conceptually think of our root object as like our entry point into concurrency, our entry point into the asynchronous operations. So some class, like a UI class, maybe will say to our root object, which could be a view model, hey, some button was clicked, and then all of a sudden, that's when we need to start the coroutines magic going. That's when we need to worry about asynchronous operations going on. Okay, so that's kind of the general points here. The last thing I just wanted to point out, and we'll see this really quickly in demo, is uh, what you're gonna be doing is we have our root object and then let's say we have like multiple different classes to get our work done so maybe we have like our view model and then we have our repository and then we have our room database okay each of those each of the functions we call the subsequent functions are going to be suspending functions they're going to have the suspend modifier and that allows us to keep everything nested and in our scope cancelable and then if we have a situation where we need to jump to say the IO thread we still make it a suspending function so this is like our room database here and then we use the with context coroutine builder and we give the with context coroutine builder dispatchers.io this is how we say do this on the IO thread Okay, so that's a verbal explanation. The last thing we'll do, and I realize this is a very long lesson, but hopefully this is useful information for you, is we're gonna run through a quick example of like an end-to-end, -end, basically an end-to-end -end example in an Android app of what I literally just explained to you. And the code is open source. So I'm gonna open up Kotlin Notes MVVM, or Jetpack Notes MVVM Kotlin. Link in the description box below. And, okay. So what are we gonna do here? So let's go step by step through what I just told you. So step number one, all of my view models, all of them, extend base view model, which is a class I created here, which extends view model from Android architecture components, but that's not important. But it also, our base view model, is given a UI context object, or sorry, possesses a UI context object as a property, and it extends coroutine scope. So this is what I was talking about before. We have some kind of object which uh, has a life cycle or at least plays nicely with your Android life cycle, and base view model is a great example. And uh, we make it a coroutine scope. When we do that, if I just kind of delete this here, when we do that, we basically have to override some kind of coroutine context. And just notice that we're adding the UI context here. So that's the part I was talking about where we specify main thread. We set our coroutine scope up on the main thread, okay. So I'm just going to add that back in. And also notice that this root thing, this root scope, whatever you want to call it, um, also has this job tracker object. Now, there's actually an easier way to build this thing, but what is this job tracker? Up here, I create it. It's just a job. Get a job. <laughs> and... Uh, this is what allows for our cancellation. This job, basically, if we, within this, whatever view model extends base view model, we can basically say to this thing, hey, cancel what you're doing, and it'll cancel everything in the, the coroutine scope. Okay, so that's step number one. 
Now let's look at a particular view model. Now this view model extends base view model. So just understand that's what's going on here. Just understand. So we, we've got our, our root coroutine scope. Once we set that up from our function, this is where we jump into coroutines land. We make that function, the first one that gets called when we want to start working asynchronously, we, we give this function a, a launch coroutine builder. You can do other things. You can use async. Um, for most people learning, I, I, launch is, I think, a little conceptually might be a bit easier to work with. Uh, well, maybe it depends. I, I guess it depends on what you prefer. But just understand we're using this launch coroutine builder. So everything that is within our launch builder here can be considered to be part of our suspending function, essentially. What does that actually mean? What does this thing actually do? By wrapping this code in our launch block, we can have asynchronous functions. Sorry, I'm in full screen mode. By wrapping this launch object in our, wrapping our function in this launch object, we're entering coroutines land and then we can call suspending functions, other coroutines. We can nest other coroutines in our kind of main scope that we've got going on. Now, a particular feature of the launch coroutine builder is that whatever exists within this block operates synchronously. It goes line by line. However, it doesn't block the thread it's on. This can confuse some people here. We're not threading. We're on basically the same thread, essentially, except this thing is not blocking the whole thread. Or it doesn't have to. So here is our one of our asynchronous operations here. We have note repo. Let's assume the user clicked on a particular note, and note ID is not just empty. And then we need to get that note from our backend repository. So we call our backend function. So this is basically where we go from our root object down to our suspending function. OK, let's look at note repo dot get note ID. So uh, note repo, I'll just show you really quickly. This is an interface. And notice how these interface functions are suspend functions. So once we enter coroutines LAN, land by way of a launch coroutine builder or other coroutine builders, now we need to start using our suspending functions. And that way we can nest them, and that's how all the magic really happens here. So let's look at what actually implements this repository, Firebase note repo impl. And specifically, we'll look at this get, uh, get note by ID function here. So we've got our suspend function, cool. Uh, everyone's totally happy. And then we pass in our note ID here, that's totally fine. And then we say return if active user. So we're gonna either return get remote notes or get local notes, okay? And active user, just understand, all we're doing here is we're checking is a user currently logged in? If a user is not currently logged in, then we want to get notes from the local on-device database. Otherwise, if the user is logged in, then we want to get it from the Firebase database. So just notice in this particular thing, we have a Firebase auth object to check if the user exists. We've got a remote Firestore, which is our remote database. And then we've got a note DAO, which is from Room, which is our local database. So let's assume the user is offline. So we jump to get local note by the ID. I'm just going to kill this Kotlin bytecode thing here. Here we go. So we go to get, where is it? Uh, get local note. OK. So we were in our suspend function. Now we have a special case. So as anyone who's implemented a room database knows, um, if you're going to be like using, uh, if you're not going to be returning live data objects, I believe is how it works then you need to make calls to your room database, your, your DAO object, from the IO thread, from a background thread. You can't call it from the main thread. 
otherwise it'll throw an exception. So how do we jump to the I.O. context when we've got all of this nesting stuff going on? So again, we're still in a suspend function here. So we're, we have this nested kind of coroutines set up going. And then specifically when I want to jump threads at the end of this kind of event stream, we use dispatchers.io with, with context, which is a coroutine builder. And then we give it dispatchers.io, which is how we tell it to go to the main thread, or the IO thread, excuse me. And then we actually can get the stuff out of the note, the, the DAO, in this case is what we're talking to. We're asking our, our room DAO for a note by an ID. Okay, the end result, so we did all that stuff. So all of that happens in a synchronous style. So within our launch block here, we're, we're back at our root scope. We call this function, and this thing could take 15 minutes. It's going to wait for this function to complete, and then once it's done, it's sequentially going to move down to the next line. So understand this is where con coroutines can get confusing. Within a launch coroutine builder, and also within a suspending function. Both of these things operate synchronously by default, so they go line by line. They operate, they move synchronously, they move in direct, sorry, not synchronously, sequentially, forgive me. They operate sequentially line by line, but each line can be indeterminate. It can be asynchronous. It can take 15 minutes to complete. It can take one minute to complete. Everything will just wait until that the nested coroutine finishes. Again, and obviously when I say it can wait 15 minutes, maybe your app will time out or something like that, but I'm just being uh, dramatic for effect here. So, um, I totally forgot where I was going with that particular point. Uh, so yeah, we just uh, understand this thing's going to work uh, sequentially. It's going to sequentially move through these things. And once we're done our background operation, which returns a result, notice how this thing returns a result object. Then we just check and see what the result is. Was the result successful? Did some part of our nested coroutines set up throw an exception? If it did, our result wrapper is going to catch that and we can just check and deal with it then and there. So uh, this is, has been Ryan's long-winded 40 minute long explanation of coroutines. This is my first time uh, trying to really break down this whole topic and, and show you some really practical information. So I'm happy to hear feedback and uh, um, just to understand that over time I will polish this talk more and more and give better information, but hopefully that was useful for everyone. Uh, like I say, there's, there's a lot of things you can get into with coroutines. My personal preference, especially for beginners, is to use these launch blocks to bridge into asynchronous world, the asynchronous world, and then you can just call suspending functions in direct style. Or sequential style and the result of that is we don't need callbacks anymore we don't no more staircase to hell no more callback hell that's pretty damn cool